good evening my name is ashok kamath and i am the secretary of the iit alumni center in bengaluru uh, we have been hosting these weekly webinars for the past month every saturday at this time and uh, uh, we've been very encouraged by the response we have seen uh, today we've had uh, almost 1000 people who registered to uh, join this unfortunately not everybody will get the chance to be on it up to 500 will be able to join but all those who registered will uh, have access to a recording of this uh, within 24 hours after the event is over so we will share that uh, uh, link to that video within 24 hours. Uh, today's topic is uh, very fascinating. Uh, uh, Professor Sitaram, who is the director of the Indian, of the IIT Gawahati, uh, comes up with a, a very solid punchline. India is not running out of water. In fact, water is running out of India. So, uh, you know, it's time for us to pause and think what that means. And I'm sure Professor Sitaram uh, will be able to guide us through all of that. And uh, really water is, uh, in, in today's climate after COVID-19, water is the second most important thing. So uh, we need to uh, pay attention to it. Uh, just quickly, Professor Sitaram and uh, we have the pleasure of having uh, Professor Xu Jing Yang from uh, the University of Gulagong in Australia. Uh, both Professor Sitaram and Professor Yang are uh, highly accomplished uh, scholars in this area. And especially as their background will, you know, the background of their visual will tell you, they are from coastal reservoirs. So they will uh, probably talk a lot about uh, coastal reservoirs and uh, take us through all the technologies that are there and uh, you know uh, what we should be doing uh, both in india and around the world uh, would be the uh, you know theme of today uh, i have seen many people raise their hands but i have lowered them all the time because it's not possible to get you know dozens of people to speak uh, on a webinar like this so if you have questions and answers, there is a Q and A uh, uh, button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, use that to key in your question and answer. Uh, sometimes people try, try to put it under the chat thing, uh, which may not exactly get you the visibility. Uh, so it's best to go always to the Q and A section uh, of your screen and put in your question. Uh, we will have Professor Sitaram speak uh, for uh, maybe 20, 30 minutes and he will uh, call a break at which point Professor Yang will uh, look at the questions and ask the questions of uh, Professor Sitaram and then we will continue it for another half an hour or so. So we expect this to last approximately uh, 75 to 90 minutes and I'm now going to uh, hand over uh, the screen to Professor Sitaram. Good evening to all of you. First of all, thanks to IIT ACB Bangalore Center for inviting me to present this webinar. I can see already large number of participants have logged in, more than 400, 420, in fact. And I also would like to thank Professor Chu Ching Yang, Professor of University Bolongong, who has joined for this session as a moderator all the way from Australia. Thank you so much to all of you for giving this opportunity. During this COVID-19 pandemic, I request all of you to stay home and stay safe, maintain social distance, and beat Corona-19 virus. Again, thank you everyone. I hope you will like this webinar. As you all know, water stress has caused countries around the world to consider ways to mitigate the impact of increased population and climate change. And today my talk is on what is scarcity to security. The global risk perception survey conducted among 900 recognized experts by the World Economic Forum reports that highest level of societal impact over the next 10 years will be the water crisis. 
and also you are already seeing large number of movement of people from urban areas because of covid 19 going into villages our country is a village centric country we have more than 6 lakh villages and today's agenda i'm going to talk to you i have just listed out here to briefly touch upon the sdg sustainable development goals and india's water resources and that is my punchline that is water india is not short of water actually water is running out of india that means a lot of water is actually joins the ocean within the four months of monsoon now we'll also touch upon traditional water harvesting structures and also touch upon the rainwater harvesting techniques underground dams and coastal reservoirs that's where our focus is today as you all know that I'm also, we have started, myself and Xuchin started the International Association for Coastal Reservoirs, registered in Australia. And we have a large number of uh, industries and uh, individuals who have joined us to create the awareness. And recently, I will also show you later, even United Nations has also listed in their official document uh, on the topic of coastal reservoir. And our first book is also coming out. First book in Elsevier with seven authors, which uh, is also coming out within a month's time. Now we'll present some case studies of the coastal reservoirs, and I'll conclude my talk with uh, ideas and innovation and ideas on this topic. Sustainable development goals, all the uh, countries in the world have signed to see that, you know, to alleviate the poverty. We, the 17 goals, and these, 17 goals, if you look at it carefully, all of them have a tinge of water. That is what is basically integration. All of it, all of it has a tinge of water. Uh, so these sustainable development goals are actually, we have only 10 more, year, 10 more years left with us because they have signed the agreement in 2015 and 2030, we have to fulfill these goals. Most of the states have taken this as a challenge. With the target, India, with a target of 5 trillion economy in 2024, starting with the disastrous COVID-19 affected time, it is very necessary to think very big when seeking to make a difference for the whole Indian. This transformation would not come or it would not be possible with simple modest plans. This will, in this modest planning, we have to include mission water. And I will tell you the mission water would play a major role in India, which is a village centric economy, more than six lakh villages and also a lot of industries are in semi-urban areas, particularly the medium and small scale industries are in semi-urban areas. Large number of people are now, we are seeing a reverse migration from urban areas to villages, at least for the time being. We should wait and watch whether they will come back to our cities. This can happen only when water is available at plenty. These changes can happen only when water is available at plenty with water energy foot nexus in play. So we have to understand the water energy nexus very clearly. If you look at the goal six of the, the SDG goals, very clearly ensure availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. On 1st of January, 2016, the 17 sustainable development goals of the 2030 agenda for the sustainable development adopted by the world leaders at an historic UN summit in September of 2015. That means we are only left with 10 more years as I told you earlier. The sustainable development goals are a universal call to action to end poverty, protect planet, and ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity. So in this, water is going to play a major role and this to achieve by 2030 a universal and equitable access to safe and affordable drinking water for all is also a great challenge, particularly in India. The role of these member states is to work together to encourage all member states to develop as soon as practical, ambitious national responses to the overall implementation of the agenda of the, the goal. Each goal, if you look at it, each goal is important in itself and water is very critical among all these. SDG six measures to overcome water shortage and it 
moves from what is called a shortage, what a shortage to water security. We are hearing almost every day in our newspaper till the COVID-19 came up that Bangalore is running out of water, Chennai is running out of water, and all our cities. There, I, tell me more really what I would like to remind you is, time Memorial, we have also seen many of us from small villages and towns in India. We have seen our women folk carrying water on head, but we never realized there is a shortage. Suddenly, when Chennai ran out of water, Bangalore ran out of water, we are thinking that there is a water security, water shortage, and then we need to do something about it. So we never woke up when there was a shortage, when our women folk was carrying water for a, just, a, just a pot of water. Every day, they have to move almost five to 10 kilometers to fetch water. So all, in this direction, the United Nations member states has taken a practical and ambitious uh, goal of implementing this agenda. So let me take you to world average annual precipitation. So this is a picture which clearly shows you, you see, if you look at the anything green, that means it's more than 1000 millimeter annual average uh, precipitation. So if you can see both China and India, majority of them are in a green sector. Majority of them are in a green sector. So that means green color. So that clearly indicates we have 1,000 millimeter or more uh, rainfall. But the same projected water scarcity in 2025 by the uh, IWMI projects that India, both, most of the northern part of India and uh, is shown as red. That means basically physical water security. And also most of the other portion of the coastal areas are economic water security. So if you look at the China, it's only an economic water security. So what it clearly says is the cost, the water becomes an important part of our decision making. Let me take you to India's water resources. Annual water resources, that is through the precipitation, because please remember, we have only one source of water, that is rainfall. So through the precipitation, we receive 4,000 billion cubic meters of water. And total surface water resources, if you count, is something like 690 billion cubic meter of water. So we have unaccounted of almost like 2000 billion cubic meter of water. Where is it going? They are all basically flood waters. I will show you some more details as we go along. From the unaccounted 2000 billion cubic meter of water, what we need to do is we need to check a little bit of evaporation and deep percolation, and then whatever the flood water which is going into the ocean. These are the three aspects which actually account to this 2,000, more than 2,000 billion cubic meter water. Story of India. So we have more than 400 rivers in total with 25 basins. Out of that, major river systems are seven. And if you look at it, majority of them discharge water to the Bay of Bengal. Total surface runoff is more than 77%. indo Ganges is the third largest in the world, which basically that's the area where the IWMI showed entire thing is red. East and West flowing rivers in Western Ghats, where uh, we have large number of rivers, which are only 100 or 150 kilometers long, uh, just directly pours into the uh, Arabian Sea. There is a fantastic drainage system. We have one is Himalayan and the other one is the peninsular drainage system. And we are, our government of India is also aware of all these issues. They've started a new Jal Shakti water power uh, unit in 2019, complements to them, but still we need to do a lot of things. And also I will touch upon the river licking issues in a little while. So if you look at the annual rainfall in India, this is the picture I've looked at the data from 1901 to 2013 here. And not even one year we have gone below 1000 millimeter average rainfall. I just, curiosity, I just looked at the 2013 to 2020, just a few minutes back, and it is much more than 1,000 millimeter, 1,200 to 1,300 millimeter per year. So this annual rainfall in India, when we have 1,000 millimeters and above, how we can have what we call shortage? What is, where, what is happening to this water, which is coming through the um, precipitation? So we have seven major, river systems, if you look at the runoff of the Indian rivers, the huge discharges, all of this happens in three, three to five months of the monsoon. Majority of the rivers joined the Bay of Bengal and most of these west flowing rivers, which I talked about from almost like uh, uh, the Gulf of Kutch 
to the Kerala coast, all of them, we have a lens of, uh, river lens of only 100 to 120 going through the Western Ghats. Most of them dump very clean water into Arabian Sea. The flow rates are much, much higher than major rivers listed here in the Western Ghats area. So you can look at some of the average discharges. They're very, very large. And what is happening is, why this large water is simply going, we have really transformed the landforms. See, earlier in the past, we have a lot of trees, which we have really killed all of them. So nature used to recharge the surface and throw water and so on through these trees and roots. But today we have a lot of concretization and also due to soil erosion and siltation, we have lost the capacity to store water. So large amount of water, so you can visualize that when, when, a, when a heavy rain occurs in Bangalore or in big cities, within a half an hour, entire area would become almost like a drive. So the degradation of forest, increased soil erosion have reduced the resident time of water in the different layers of the earth and which makes the entire water just moving towards the ocean through the drainage pattern. So let me take you through the some of the how our rivers are in Indian rivers are. Basically, in most places, except living one or two uh, Indo Gangetic uh, plain rivers, most of the Western Ghats rivers and our Eastern Ghats rivers are all like this. They have the source in the mountains, and then a tributaries will be joining and the confluence, and then basically they come down the hill and slowly reduces to a delta and estuary in the mouth. These stages of the river, we can divide them into three courses, upper course, middle course, and lower course. In middle course, the well flows with moderate velocity and vertical and lateral erosion is high. Plenty of streams are going to join. There are meandering of the rivers, alluvium fans. But in the upper course, the velocities are very high. So you can see they bring in a lot of debris. See, a lot of eroded soil from the hilly area. So there is basically vertical erosions. You can see that through many falls creating waterfalls, rapids, gorges. In the lower course, the velocity is basically very low. So lateral erosion dominates and wide channel. Why I'm highlighting this is, please remember, when we have the dams, most of our dams are constructed either in the middle course or in the, in the top course, like Chehri and all those. So in this upper course or a middle course, a lot of our dams are located and conventional even rainwater harvesting techniques can be adopted over there. That's what we are nowadays doing it. But what I am wanting you to concentrate in the lower course, there is nothing much we have done. So what I'm looking at is water management at the last mile, where entire catchment area of water of the river is available to you. So it's you just imagine when you're taking bath, if you try to catch water somewhere in the body or in the head, you will only get a very little quantity of water. But if you get at the bottom, at the toe, you will get entire water. It may be dirty, but the dirty water could be only five minutes. After that, whatever you run through your shower, it's almost a clean water because all the dirt is removed in five to 10 minutes when you're taking a bath. Similar thing happens in the rivers. So underground dams and coastal reservoirs, what is the one what we can look at it at the downstream management of the river course. So India is very actually rich in this understanding of traditional water harvesting structure. Whether you go to Rajasthan in Tankas, uh, Khadin and Dora in Western Rajasthan, Bawdi, Gujarat and Rajasthan, they knew how to store this water. They also knew the cycle of water. Our monsoon comes only three months or four months in a year, and then it goes off. They have understood that they need to store water. See, they had created such structures, but what has happened over a period of time, we have killed all these conventional, traditional water harvesting structures. I would like to show you some of these other traditional harvesting structures, chuck dams, diversion ways. They are all local languages are also very, very common. Cheru in Andhra Pradesh, Chitur and Kadapa districts, and Cheru embankments are pitted basically with sluices also. So we, we can see the Bandharas, and then this is the traditional uh, Bengal, inundation canal where they used to cut the embankment to really uh, to the fields so that they can get a crop. So the cutting the embankment used to do, that means they basically they knew how to use the flood water. I don't know what has happened over a period of time. We have forgotten 
to utilization of the flood water. See, the Kuni Bandara is also a network of well structures interconnected through an underground tunnel. These are all very, very existing in our uh, country. So we can also look at Surangam in Kerala. This is what the network of uh, tunnels, what I was talking to you. And then Udaipur Water Web. All these lake, whether it's Picholo Lake, Kutesagar Lake, all of them are interconnected underground. So a lot of geotechnical knowledge was there during those times. For a period of time, we have resorted to only large dams. So let me also take you through the other rainwater harvesting techniques we have started adopting very recently. The chuck dams, nullabands, contour trenches, percolation tanks, soak pits, and then subsurface dikes or dams, sand dams, infiltration wells, injection wells, water pools. So all of these, you know, try to store water underground. The major disadvantage in these, these, some of these things is you need to still pump water because they are stored in underground. One good thing is you, you very difficult to contaminate this because you do not see the entire water is below. So, but what has happened, many cities have started putting a lot of bore wells. So that is why the groundwater is going very deep and deep. So we need to augment actually this rainwater harvesting techniques in our urban areas to adopt. Some of these picturized uh, harvesting structures, you can see the contour bands, will try to reduce the lateral flow horizontal flow of the water so that the vertical velocity, I mean, there is enough time so that vertically water will get in and sink into the underground. Then that will be act like a storage. See, in many of the uh, underground storage, we need to augment this. When the rainfall comes, we should allow it to go down rather than laterally flowing down. So right now, most of the water is going through. Some of the simple boulder checks actually it can be done. So it has been being done in some of the areas in the country, but not very popular. Similarly, the recharge wells, recharge bore wells, some of the pictures. So this was, I was actually associated with some of the scientists who are working with Art of Living. They have taken many, many towns and villages in Karnataka and many other states also to do this rainwater harvesting. So another important thing is their forestation. So it basically prevents soil erosion, accelerate water infiltration, attracts water molecules to the gravity zone, enhances water retention through capillary action and long-term permanent solution for water problem. Please remember, you need to start planting trees. So in IIT Guwahati, we have made a, made, a, made a point that every student who joins actually creates a plant. He plants himself and takes care of another, for another four years. So there are underground dams which I talked about. What these are underground dams. See, what you're looking at the right side, the surface dam which stores water above the ground level, so which is open to the sky, which there is evaporation losses and many other things. But what happens is this is the ground level. You can also create an underground dam so that water is stored in the pores. The storage may be little now. It's only 30 to 35% of the porosity of the soil mass. But however, underground dam have no huge tank under the ground generally have a lot of porosity in the aquifer. In other words, underground dam reserves the groundwater in the hard, porous uh, soil sponges. So this dam basically intercepts the groundwater flow and store groundwater into the ground. Another important thing, if it is very close to the coastal area, if the salt water is coming in, it also stops salt water intrusion into our river, into a freshwater zone. So the freshwater is very clearly isolated and stored for future use or something like in summer. You could use that summer. This cycle of, see the rains and no rain season, we have to maintain. To no rain season, that's the time we need to store water to use when water, rain, rain water, rain god is not pleasing us. So this kind of dams, Japan has adopted so many. So you could not believe it. So large number of Japanese dams are underground. So they're also very safe in the point of the earthquakes, you know, or tsunami. They cannot get, get dominated. So Japan has very large number of dams. You can see the dams are like this, you know, just below a structure. They are, these are called sand dams. It is, need not be only to the river course. It could even extend to a large extent so that you can store water. So what you need to build is a kind of a diaphragm wall, cutting off the water flowing into the ocean. So this kind of subsurface dams is another one. So challenges faced by Indian river basins are what we are trying to do is we are trying to see whether we can connect Ganga to Kaveri, Kaveri to Krishna. So water is basically a state subject. State subject. Can you hear me? 
center is only to manage hello are you are you able to hear me yes professor yes, we can yes, hear you yes yeah yeah center is only to manage the interstate disputes so a lot of interstate disputes are going on legally you you know so this is not a really a good solution for linking rivers and we are also creating a lot of damage so this also shows us that coastal reservoir plan would be much better so it's a great challenge to adopt interlinking rivers both from the environmental consideration and also cost consideration so that's what we are seeing it now one more idea i would like to show you so we talk about a lot of water uses so if you look at the how the water is used in the in the world as well as in the low and middle income countries like india and china so agriculture is the major use 82% of the water whatever we are using we are actually using agriculture for agriculture for production of food so that is why i talked about water and food and also majority of our dams are also large dams for power generation so if you look at it that there is a really clear nexus between water and energy and food so this if you look at this picture much more carefully the domestic use of this entire water is only the 8% and industrial use is about 10% so that is not a different scenario even to the developed world see only the industrial use will be little bit 22% but domestic use is same as 8% so what we are trying to what i'm trying to say is if you are able to save if you are able to teach our farmers the water consumption how to really consume water in their farms very efficiently like we can take from israel or some technologies in water consumption whether it is a drip irrigation or anything then we can save large quantity of water see it is not just uh, you know your, uh, you you might be hearing the advertisement in the media saying that you while you are brushing your teeth please close your tap that's very very small significant number definitely it should be done i'm not against that but what we need to do at the same time is we have to teach our farmers to use it very efficiently the water resources then the quantity of water we save could be much more than the what we are consuming in the domestic internet has some problem right all right <clears throat> I'll just get in touch with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, everybody now, uh, and I to uh, thanks for Professor Sisana for the wonderful presentation. He mentioned about some things from the history, from the Indian, from the UN neighbor to to so many wide angle also uh, to the. Um, I'm coming. I'm coming. Yeah, I'm yeah, coming. Yeah. I'm coming. yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. You're okay. Can you can you see me? Yeah. Now we can see you again. So we, I I already talked about the interlinking of rivers is a very great challenge for India, particularly through the interbasin transfers. And then we need we can store more in inland reservoirs, but our country is such a terrain where a lot of our reservoirs are already silted, and and i will also talk about and we have to move look at the replenish of the ground water i've already talked about desalination from sea water see this is the one foolish thing i am very sorry to use this word but desalination from sea water we are allowing our fresh water in the monsoon into the ocean take that back and clean it up so this is ridiculous i am telling you instead of that we have to find innovative way of storage rather than desalinating uh, for taking from sea water desalination is also not a very safe environmental practice why because uh, once you remove the salt water salt from the sea water wherever you deposit the salt most of the aqua life would be destroyed so almost 2 3 kilometers where you discharge the salt water from the desalination plant there is no aquatic life will be remaining so there are a lot of challenges actually desalination may be good for saudi arabia israel where the rainfall is very low but not for country like india so coming to the waste water treatment and reuse there are a lot of options for you this is a fantastic thing which we have done many of the things but many times because of operational challenges this will not work second is the taboo so i think even india with the kind of culture we have we will never drink the toilet water what we call nay water 
So that is another challenge. But this will be have to be done. Why? Because this we can use it for industrial purpose. So finally, what I'm look, focusing on the concern of the flood waters which is joining the ocean. I'm going to tell you the next slide. So all these options for us, inland dams, interbasin transfer, desalination plant, wastewater recycling are a very great challenge. So coastal reservoirs is one option which we'll throw out for a solution for our water resources. Let's look at before going to the coastal reservoir, what has happened in the surface water storage. So we have almost built, you see, look at it. When we got independence, we had 300 large dams. So as we, as we all know that the large dams are the one dam which is having a 1 million meter cube of water or a dam which is 15 meter tall or more. There are several definitions as per the International Community of, Community of Large Dams. So India has built since independence more than 5,600 dams. So large, such large dams. In India, we had about 300 large dams in 47. And now today we have more than close to 6,000 dams, 5,700 dams. India ranks third in the world in dam building after USA and China. But how much water we are storing in these dams? We are only storing less than 10% of the average precipitation we receive. We are storing less than 10%. And if you look at the dams, see the majority of their dams are in Maharashtra. Can you believe it? Just three years back, Maharashtra used the trains to transfer water having almost more than 1,800 dams, large dams, still we have a shortage. So uh, what I'm looking at is actually there is no shortage of water, there is a shortage of storage. We need to really improve this. But where is our going to look at, where are we building our dams? We are building our dams, large number of them in the Northeast, which is actually zone five as per the earthquake. So largest these dams are very amenable to large earthquakes. So if you look at the large distribution of India, number of large dams we have built sometime between 1970 to 1990. See, and then 1980 to 1990, we almost built 1,000 to 800,000, but 4,000 dams we have built somewhere up to 2,000. So, and we have also come up with dam rehabilitation improvement projects. Why did we come up with this concept? Because most of all dams are majority of the large dams. Okay, see, even though our largest dams are earth dams, but among the large, uh, tall, taller dams are our concrete dams. So we always imagine that concrete is going to survive forever. But the life of the concrete, if you look at it, it only survives between 50 to 100 years. After that, what happens to those dams? We have to remove them. Similarly, you, none of these dams can survive more than 100 years. So if you look at the future, then what our grand-grandchildren are going to drink water from? Are they going to drink from these large dams we have constructed? It's only for 100 years. So this is the question we need to ask. But another thing which I would like to highlight to you is in the dam rehabilitation improvement project funded by World Bank, we have so far only done 213 dams we have done the dam break analysis. 223 dams were listed for repairs and other things. So we were not able to, there is not enough money to really to take up all the dams what we have constructed over a period of time. So the Honorable Prime Minister said in 1962, the temples are, the modern temples of India are the dams. In the 20th, when he inaugurated the Bakra project, Bakra Nangal project, 1962, that means he said, the, 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 the modern temples of India are going to be the dams. That's where we have focused, and it is fantastically, we have done very well, and compared to the whole world. And, but look at, look at our dams now. Everywhere our, we have a dams. Where is going to be the next temple? Where is our new temple in the 21st century? So we do not have left with any, other, any, any space actually. We have completely covered entire India by building dams. We are now building in the Northeast. So the future solutions would be, so I feel, you know, the time memorial, if you go back, you know, we had actually a surface map based water utilization and as the population increased and people moved, we all started looking at the dams. And now I think when population, we are almost saturated, 1.3 billion people, then we have to look at something very close to the coastal area. So this has one advantage, we can store more water. It's 20 times more than the demand. There is a lot of things which you can do because 
the already the water velocities are slow so it's very easier to construct when compared to the dams constructing here because the velocities will be very high so we have to uh, i mean build structures to withstand that kind of pressure but when you come closer to the coast the pressure is also from the ocean side so there will be a less pressure on these materials so it is much easier to build so this is what we are looking at the future solution will be the coastal reservoirs so our first book in the elsevier on sustainable water supply in coastal reservoir is coming out in the next month actually with 14 chapters sorry 16 chapters and myself and professor chu ching are the main authors and others are also included here so you can see this is going to be released uh, in the month of august published date is august 2020 so you can see so this is the first book which is going to come out so i will actually you know take you through some of the advantages of the coastal reservoirs what's a large dam so the inland reservoir we have a limited gorge but unlimited in the sea i it need not be only in the sea please understand it is closer to the coast we will actually explain to you and also with some case studies i will take you through and dam design very high pressure here but low pressure with but wave surge seepage will be pressure difference by density difference pollutant is a land based a lot of people in towns and villages which are there upstream of that but here that is the one major issue we need to solve the pollutant problem pollutant problem anyway we have to handle it whether it is inland reservoir or the coastal reservoir immigrant cost is very high here we don't displace any people please remember we are not displacing any people water supply by gravity partly and in partly majority of northern karnataka you can see we are actually pumping again from the reservoirs what we constructed to reach out to the areas where it is not possible but in the coastal reservoir we don't have much option other than pumping so i will come to that so how many coastal reservoirs are existing already netherlands has built in 1932 itself as a flood control measure india has built in 1974 tane mukambad in kerala for agriculture south korea has built hong kong china and singapore united kingdom have also built the dams so cool so coastal reservoirs what we myself and suching are talking about is the second generation not the first generation coastal reservoir i will alert you what is first generation first generation is the basically blocking the river river mouth entirely so in that way we are collecting all the pollutants also there so that's not a good idea so what we are talking about is during the monsoon you can actually create a, a dam reservoir just outside the mouth of the river then automatically you can get when the water is good you can leave the water to the uh, coastal reservoir when the water is dirty it can bypass go out so this is a convex water body second generation with curved and long barriers and bypasses the polluted water stores only clean water and minimum environmental and social impacts because our fishermen can get in and we are not stopping any fishermen going into our rivers and then also uh, uh, river transportation also can happen and we can also create a wetland pre treatment so there are many new wetlands can be created through this so i will actually take a break here and maybe i will let shuching to highlight some points and then i will continue with my case studies that's all i have actually thank you very much hello thank you professor sisana wonderful presentation this reminds me a story that means your presentation reminds me a a a, a, a good man in my mind like all my sisters brothers in india gandhi your presentation support what he said he says there is sufficiency in the world for man's need but not for man's greed you give us the hope that means in india we can solve this problems and if we change our mind thank you very much this one you open us the the the, the mind the water problem so important to everybody and uh, and now i have some questions to ask you on behalf of that uh, the uh, audience one and uh, these two questions you can answer together how flood water can be controlled from reaching the ocean so that maximum utilization may be possible that means you are going to develop flood water another question yes if we reduce 
water discharge into the ocean flood water if we reduce this water to the ocean will we interfere with the monsoon cycle one for <laughs> flood water uh, development for water resources another one for flood disaster mitigation can we link both of them together use your idea yeah you see first of all let me tell you that there is an apprehension that we are going to stop entire water there is no way impossible humanly impossible to stop store all the water we can only do with all all our big plants maybe another 3 to 4% of the water resources what is available see so far we have taken almost 70 years to build 5600 dams we have increased our storage maybe about 3% to about 8% so that means 8% of the precipitation which falls on our ground so we we might go from 8% to maybe about 11 to 12% so that means first of all that means we are not stopping entire water which is flowing through the river we are only taking a very small portion 3 to 4 percent of water we are going taking to store water. That itself is a very large quantity of water, ladies and gentlemen. So that is almost like a, a thousand billion cubic meter water. So that means what I'm trying to say is we are not really going to stop all the water which is going into the ocean. And also with second generation, one more beautiful thing is happening. See, all the sediment which is joining the ocean also will join. So we are not actually stopping the sediments as well. So that means salts which have to supposed to join the ocean, we are allowing to ocean. So there is no actually environmental uh, damage through this. I hope I have answered the question. Yeah. What, uh, Thank you very much. Next question is three panel for improving national water quality include the regulations, policy, technology, and the implementation. India is rich in policies and technologies, but lag behind implementations. What can be done to enhance implementations process already well tested technologies? This one, Coast Reservoir Underground Dam has been tested, and then how to improve this policy or implementation? So the policy of implementation is why it's taking a lot of time. So we need to look at that because India is a democratic country. And also water is a state subject. Water is a state subject. So for example, Karnataka wants to build or Andhra Pradesh wants to build a dam. They need to take permission from the Karnataka state. So up, up, upper Liberian states have to permit and also there must be an agreement. So this water sharing agreement will take a lot of time because the, I will tell you, we are still fighting for 10, 10 uh, TMC of water with Goa, 10 TMC of water with uh, Tamil Nadu. Karnataka is fighting every, almost uh, every year, you know, soon after uh, when, when summer comes, water is becoming a major issue. So I think, you know, coastal reservoirs, what will happen is, this is nobody's water, which is joining the ocean we are trying to store. So actually the litigations between the states will come down. That automatically saves a lot of time. That gives you a lot of time for implementation. So we need to look at this in that context of interstate disputes, what we are having because of water sharing agreements between the states. So similarly, the water which is going underground, which is also water which belongs to the each state. So increasing water ingress into the ground and storing in coastal reservoir are the better options than building dams, large dams. So through this, I think the interstate disputes can reduce the time, so implementation becomes much faster. Thank you, Professor Sana. This reminds me a, a, a great man, a PM, a Singapore PM, uh, Lee Kuan Yew. He said, in terms of his government, water is the king. All other policies should be done in front of the water. So this means uh, all other policies are not so important uh, like water. Water dominated the, 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 his, his, uh, his policy. Thank you very much. And, uh, Can I and, continue? Uh, 
Yeah, 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 please. Yeah. I, I have a, another uh, very briefly, uh, maybe another 10, 15 minutes, I will be able to conclude. So okay. uh, as I told you, I have stopped. So this is the Shanghai experience. See, Shanghai city has built a coastal reservoir. You see, you can see that in the right side bottom picture. So this is the coastal reservoir, what Shanghai city has built. In the right, in the, uh, uh, in the river, Yangtze, Yangtze River Basin. It's in the delta. This is the coastal reservoir, what it is being coming. So through a wetland, water enters into the coastal reservoir. And this is one of the unique second uh, generation coastal reservoir constructed in the world. Professor Young was actually involved in some portion of the decision making of this. And they supply to the Shanghai city and more than almost 60% of the Shanghai citizens get water from this coastal reservoir. You can clearly see that Shanghai is able to do that, you see. And also they constructed when? In 2008, Chinkosa Coastal Reservoir started its construction. 2010, they have completed. Start pumping fresh water from the sea. So this means 2012, that means four to five years. But imagine our Sardar Sarovar Dam, when it was started construction. I remember very clearly, Sardar Sarovar Dam was 1964, okay? And uh, when it was foundation was put. And when it was handed over to the nation, 2017, one dam, if we take more than 55 years to construct and uh, then start uh, giving it to the people, then that clearly shows that there is some serious issue of interstate, interstate disputes, environmental damage, and large dams are not the solution. Anyway, we have built now, I think we need to look at the future. As we are saying, the whatever storage we've created with our large dam is so small, this is not enough for the increasing population of India. So we need to really now look at the, still our villages and towns doesn't have drinking water, the, the water doesn't come to their homes. So to really fulfill and become a vital in economy, we need to do a mission water. This mission water is that we, we have to increase our food production, we have to increase our energy production, and we, this water energy nexus we need to solve. So let's look at some of the case studies of the coastal reservoirs. Netherlands constructed in 1933, Azalmir, uh, this one, is across the Warden Sea. This is the dam which is created. You can see clearly this is being used as a very, almost a highway of a four-lane or six-lane highway, which you can see on the left side. And this is a, a remote sensing image where you can see the dam. The Warden Sea is a very rough sea. And today, the Isalmira has really become a freshwater reservoir, but they constructed not for storing freshwater, they constructed to save from the floods. So you can see these are the new land created in Finland. This is another thing happens. So the land is today is a commodity. So because of the coastal reservoir, you can create a new green land, which is which has been developed in uh, Amsterdam, very similar to that in Netherlands, what we can do even in our countries. So this is basically the dam in Azalmir was constructed in Netherlands for a flood control, but we can think about now storing for the fresh water. Look at the Hong Kong scenario. So Hong Kong was actually people like what we see in our villages in India, even they were carrying with water in pots. So you can see the water was a really a great commodity in 63, 64 with water rationing. Use of seawater for flushing was also adopted that time. So freshwater reservoirs in the sea, they constructed in 1957 to 1963. Blower Cow, I'll show you some pictures. And then what happened is they de decommissioned the desalination plant. Hong Kong de decommissioned the desalination plant in 1975. But again, the policies are reversing anyway. This is the ship of reservoir. See, we, before joining the ocean, they built a dam and stored water. Please remember, Hong Kong is a very small city, actually, is less than even Bangalore. So similarly, this is a flower cove reservoir in Hong Kong. So where you can see they simply built a construction, a small dam, and then which gave a large storage for them before this water joins the ocean. These are all first generation reservoirs. Similarly, Singapore. Singapore, if you remember in 2007, 2008, they were scared that Malaysia is going to stop water for them. So they have built what is called as Marina Barrage. Marina Barrage is only 350 meters across the Marina Canal. And this is the building a dam across the moat. This is the concrete dam they were constructed, which can tilt actually, depending on the rainfall. See, if the rainfall is very heavy, this can tilt and allow water from the river, from the river to the ocean, 
and uh, stop the ocean water coming inside. So this is the catchment area. This is also, remember, first generation coastal reservoir. The way are not propagating that. So this today, this Marina Barrage gives 10% of the islands, Singapore island water needs. So this is the dam, the steel gate, which we can see. And there are also huge uh, underwater uh, pipes, which can throw away when the rainfall is very heavy through this concrete base. So there are basically huge pumps which can pump when there is a rainfall as well as the high tide together. So in that case, the barrage is functioning in, in Marina Barrage in Singapore. So the Marina Barrage catchment area, if you look at it, this is the barrage. And if we can see the entire Singapore uh, water will come there. So Marina Barrage stretches across the mouth of the wide channel. Most expensive real estate in Singapore, they were able to build uh, along the uh, Marina Barrage area. So you can see now what has been, how it has been transformed. So you can see the most impressive smart project today in Singapore. It has received the best environmental water management technology awards. This is the dam with the gates, sluice gates, and this was before. The picture in the left side is clearly before in 2005 and what it appears now in 2010 or 12 or even now. So, May 2016 report said protecting Manhattan. So it's a, it also developed a sea deep fishing harbor. So there are so many other opportunities, you know, because they have displaced the fisherman harbor from here to the deep fishing harbor. Now fishermen can go into deeper uh, ocean. Similarly, Simangam Sea Wall was constructed in Korea. Uh, you can't see anything here, but if you closer to go, you can start seeing the deck construction. And this is about 400 square kilometer area reclined, freshwater reservoir of about 117 kilometer square. And the world's longest man-made dike, about 33 kilometer long, is here. So this is, uh, you can see the now constructed dam is like this. This is the dam, which is almost like a ground level. One side is the uh, sea water, one side is the fresh water. And uh, this is also a first generation reservoir. Please remember, this is not like Chinkosa Reservoir, which is constructed in Shanghai. That is the best thing actually, but these are all having a problem that any polluted water can come and get stored behind. That is another issue, but this is very, it is similar to any large dams what we, con uh, what we construct internally. These are also dams will have a sluice gates as to really allow salt water sedimentation sediments to leave out. But these are all again I'm repeating they're all first generation coastal reservoir. What we from the International Association Coastal Reservoir from propagating the idea of second generation coastal reservoir, where we do not block the entire river mouth. We only take water when water is plenty, particularly during monsoon type of uh, conditions. So, and there are technologies also to build. Uh, and every country, I think, even India knows how to build these kind of uh, technologies. So, we are, the dikes are built using geotextile bags, using the material in the uh, bottom of the ocean. So, that means the same sand silt could be packed into geotextile bags, and you can start constructing and put a concrete surface, and the dam is ready. So it's very easy to construct when compared to, you don't need to depend on complete concrete like what we have done in the dams. And the, these are all geosynthetic sea dike, cross section of the sea dike with geosynthetic bags. Uh, this is how you, we really create. And one side is the ocean and one side is the fresh water. So how do we do this? There's also technology is very, uh, we can fill up the geotextile using the pipeline from the bottom of the ocean itself. The sandbag you can pump into this geotextile. Once the water goes out of the geotextile bag, your uh, dikes are ready and these are, can be, these are the geotextile tubes and this is the sand and the dam is ready. So this is the dike construction using geotubes. There are a lot of advantage of these coastal reservoirs. One is no harm to the river, brain, river basins or alteration to the river course because we are at the lowest uh, part of the river where it, it simply joins the ocean. That, that location we are talking about. No disturbance of forest cover or submergence of land. See, many of the large dams, the major issue of why this construction delays are happening because of displacement of people, villages and towns. And that's where, and also forest, because today forest uh, cover is also very, very important for us. So we, but this technology will not really disturb any of the forest cover and submerged lot. No physical displacement of people. Impounding on land reservoir. 
So triggered seismicity is also less. You see many of the Quina Dam, for example, has had triggered a large uh, earthquake of almost magnitude of six. So that kind of a problem because the large reservoirs very close to the faults can cause such a problem. And what in the local, in the coastal areas, agriculture activity can be augmented, coastal erosion can be minimized, groundwater recharge due to fresh water in estuarian areas can be increased, intrusion of saline water can be stopped, fresh water dredging will allow and dams become seismic resistant dams. So please note this, we can also generate solar energy because now we are on a larger area or near the coast there is no cover so we can actually put solar panels on our, our reservoir also very smaller depth because these coastal reservoir uh, will be a depth of 10 to 15 meters deep so we can put actually a lot of a lot of solar panels and generate solar energy we can generate tidal energy and we can also on the roadway what we are talking about the dam 33 kilometer dam what you saw in the chinkos or any other dam you can put a lot of uh, the roadways so that it will reduce the traffic also. The freshwater fishing, navigation, tourism, real estate opportunities, and seawall serves as a deterrent to tidal erosion and serves as a deep water fishing harbor. It also serves as a deep water fishing harbor. It increases the industrial activity and it creates a new land and new opportunities. So these are all the lot of advantages. There are disadvantages. What are the disadvantages? If you adopt the first generation coastal reservoir, salt water intrusion, Pollution control becomes an issue, algal blooms becomes an issue, sediment accumulation becomes an issue, and ecosystem balances people talk about. We need to study and understand. But all of these, all of these, we strongly believe can be handled in the design and operation of the coastal reservoir. So there is nothing really uh, damaging through this adopted. So recently, UN Water has brought out the document on water and climate change. They have clearly referred our work and put a coastal reservoir as one of the options in this book. So if some of you wanted to see, you can go to the United Nations website and look at that coastal reservoir has been put as one of the other alternative options, which was not there earlier. So our uh, idea has been, so India has also done a thought process in this direction. So they've already identified a, one project near the Gulf of Kambat, okay? called Kalpasar project. You can see the actual website of Kalpasar and uh, in a geography location of Kalfasa project is in the Gulf of Kambat, that is the north of Mumbai and south of Surat or, uh, or uh, the east of Surat. So you can see that and this is the dam. So what is this is thanks to Prime Minister Modi that he has really planned it so well so that they can put a contour canal from this reservoir into entire Kutch area. So the Kalpasar dam is almost like 40 uh, kilometer long and which will connect basically Baruch to Bhavnagar. So that basically and removes. So this is also people are talking about because we have, this is all salt water and which and we sense it's a building a dam of this kind may be very dangerous. So people are also talking about now doing this one. That is freshwater basin only restrict this side where towards Narmada and the next tidal basin we can kept it alive so that uh, our Uh, near Bausen, so that this will be a salt water, so the fishermen can still survive. This is what one other thought process, then, but the dam length becomes now 64 kilometers long. So the grass storage will be 16,000 million cubic meters of water. Once constructed, it will be the largest reservoir in India. So, and my idea is, you know, if you can create a smaller uh, coastal reservoirs all across our large coastline, and connect them through sea subsea pipeline. You see, please remember, now we are at zero means high level at all these locations. So we don't need to cut any mountains. We don't need to cut any other things. So we can connect them through pipelines. So gravity flow. So there is a good possibility of connecting Ganga to Kaveri, not what KL Rao thought about Ganga to Kaveri through our very difficult mountain terrain. So this is a good possibility. And then if you are able to generate large amount of solar power and a wind power, then we can at least easily pump at 100 kilometer interior the, our water. So the reservoirs can be connected and then continuous water will be available if the rainfall is this side, you know, this water, that is dissolved, basically snow fed rivers, so can feed uh, the water to the entire network. So I call this concept called Sarovar Mala and even I have patented it and also uh, the Sarovar Mala is being registered as a uh, emblem. So the, this is the patent which we have uh, created. Reservoirs along with the solar power generating station 
all along the coast can easily uh, pump water to at least about 100 kilometers inside in certain locations. So, uh, and there are areas where we can create this, uh, the, the, the reservoirs can be created, did not be at the mouth of the river. Please remember, this could be an area where there is a lot of sea erosion. There you can identify this reservoir and construct the barrage and bring the water through pipeline into store and store water. So we need to increase the storage. Our storage has to increase because our population has increased. So our population and our way of living is also changed. So we need more water mount for domestic you say. So we need water for domestic, we need water for irrigation, so food production, and we need water for power. So all these water, unless we store more water, and we cannot do all these at a time. So we have to look at some of the new innovative ideas to look at that. So what to end, to conclude my talk today, India, ladies and gentlemen, is not running out of water. Because I've shown you very clearly, 1,000 millimeter rainfall, which is a huge water, 4,000 billion cubic meter of water, we're only able to store 800 billion cubic of water. So even if you do all these, another 400 to 500 billion cubic meter of water, you're going to store, not the entire water. So India is not running out of water, but water is running out of India. We need to use some portion of that, 10% of that water which is running out of India for our benefit. Desalination is very expensive and that is not for our country. So that is really a foolish idea to allow our fresh water to join the ocean and then take it back again, clean it up with a huge environmental, I mean, with a power cost, as well as creating environmental damage around where you leave out the waste water of the desalination plants, so which is environmentally not sustainable. Underground dams is a very good idea, which we can actually store, but this is not a large quantity of water storage. See, reservoir, coastal reservoirs are a very large quantity of water. We talk about now uh, 50 billion cubic meter water, 100 billion cubic meter water storage, but underground dams can be stored in small quantity, so we can practice underground dams and we can practice rainwater harvesting systems, but if you, require, if you require large quantity of water storage, we need to look at coastal reservoir. So cost of coastal reservoir also we have worked out. Cost of coastal reservoir is actually much, much smaller when compared to construction of large dams or even diversion schemes. So it is much, much smaller, so we can actually demonstrate. We have done one detailed project for Karnataka government for BWSSB, Bangalore Water Supply and Storage Board. And we have demonstrated that cost of uh, constructing a coastal reservoir near Mangalore for the sake of water is much, much cheaper than uh, uh, the diversion schemes or uh, alternative water diversion schemes or construction of a large dam. So I feel, and today I would like to end with a quote, adopt coastal reservoirs, underground dams, and also water recharge techniques, which will save us for the future. Without this storage of water, so unless we increase the storage of water inland to, for the benefit of the mankind, we will not be able to do whatever development, whatever industrialization we need to do. We need to need water. Water is the number in our body is about 70% and for every activity, we need water. So I would like to at the end welcome all of you to become a member of IACRR, International Ocean Coastal Reservoir. We're also holding first international conference in 2021 from 18th to 21st of October in Nanjing, China. Koha University is holding this in jointly in collaboration with International Association for Coastal Reservoir Research, for which I am the president. Professor Su Ching Yang is the secretary. And we welcome all of you. And thanks to IIT ACB for giving this opportunity for me to share what, what little the idea, what we are throwing it out, something, something out of the box. And thank you one and, one and all for listening, patient listening. And if there are any questions, I will take it now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sena. Wonderful uh, <coughs> presentation. Uh, this is, I believe all of us agree, this is the great voice from great man. This reminds me many years ago, USA people heard the, 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 the voice from Martin Luskins, I had a dream. Now our dream, I can see, is Sanwa Mana. Indian people, if we do this one, and then we will enjoy the beautiful life in future for our next generation. All right, uh, here I have some questions uh, from the audience. With, in to today, your, your presentation has 
uh, we saved a lot of uh, questions, answer, uh, waiting for you to answer. But I'm for, unfortunately, because of time, probably I'm un, unable to, uh, you have no time to answer everyone's question. And this question, I believe it is interesting for you to answer. Uh, probably two or three people ask the same question. River linking, river interlinking in India, important issue for irrigation. Many people's uh, irrigation purpose as India is agricultural country. When possible and what may be the possible budget required about that? Uh, can you compare your one about the cost reservoir and the river interlinking and the agriculture and the inland water resources? Professor Sitaram, can you unshare can you unshare your screen? Yes, please. Yes, I will do that. Thank you. See, uh, interlinking of rivers is yeah. 1967 when K.L. Rao came up with an idea to join Ganga to Kaveri. Are you able to do that even today? No. So the problem is our terrain is very, very difficult terrain. So we have hills, mountains, very difficult, and also huge population. We, we have country, you know, everywhere we need to displace people if you are going for interlinking people. A lot of environmental damages we're going to create. And the second question, where is the money to construct? It costs you a lot of money because somewhere you have to pump, lift irrigation, you have to up, up, up the water because to crush some of the areas. So this is an impossible dream. Definitely it is possible where, you know, maybe Krishna and Godavari can be linked, which are nearby rivers. So some of these things have happened and some of these things will never happen. So, and also today with the environmental damage and also the kind of population density we have, um, I think interlinking rivers we need to forget. Second, interlinking rivers is a very great challenge because of the interstate disputes. Because each state says, this is my watershed. Even though you are able to link it, most of the canals are, which are linked will go dry because Karnataka, upper Liberian states will never leave water to you. So this is the challenge after constructing. You will not have anything to be utilizing because the upper Liberian states will never allow the water to go. When they don't have water, how they will leave? They will only leave when there is a plenty. That means when monsoon comes, they want to leave. So not in summer. So this challenge is actually puts a river linking project to a back burner. Many river linking projects have gone to a back burner because of shortage of money and litigations and, uh, and also cost and environmental damage. But today we are looking at the lower management using coastal reservoir. It is no, it is actually the water which is going to the ocean. It is nobody's water. And we are going to store, each state is going to have its own small reservoir. In my Sarovar Mara concept, each state will have its own. So they can also collectively work together in a country like we have done that, excellently shown that we can work together. Still we can work together. We have shown, demonstrated in many aspects. So same thing we can do in a coastal reservoir linking so that you know Sarovar Mala can be created without damaging the environment, without damaging, but I will tell you, there is a lot of feasibility we have to do. This is only a concept. So we require a lot of work to be done yet, both scientifically and technologically. And we need to look at debate and understand and select these locations. This is a very initial picture which I've demonstrated to you. But what I'm trying to say is this interlinking of rivers, and large dams, we have already seen the negative effects too much. We need to now look at, concentrate on something new. As I told you, concrete is also a material which is only 50 to 100 years. We need to look at something new material. Geosynthetic gives you a lot of role. That is where geotechnology, see whatever highways you are seeing with the reinforced dirt, flyovers, what you are seeing in our national highways, are the kind of construction which you're gonna adopt in the these kind of projects as well. So I will stop here, I think that's the, Maybe I'm able to answer that question. Can you take the next question, please? Okay, thank you. Professor Sisana, and next question is how does your proposal address the need of hydroelectrical power requirement down? 
uh, requiring dams in the up and the middle river sections with such cost dams in your proposal, given the hydro, hydro projects to change uh, the river and the sealed flow, causing, have, causing significant damage for the downstream. So what, I, 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 yeah, I believe this is uh, interaction about the energy and the water and the hydropower, especially where the upstream dance hydropower affect the downstream uh, or benefit. See, the hydropower, we have already constructed large dams for power generation. But we are talking about is now not touching that water what is there already in our dams. We are only taking monsoon bounty, flood water, which is simply joining the ocean to store in our coastal district. Number one. Number two, if you are thinking, so what happens to my future generation of uh, power? As I showed you very clearly, my coastal reservoir surface, we can non-conventional uh, power resources we can generate, like solar, wind, Okay, we can generate even we can generate uh, uh, the wave wave energy uh, you know, power generations also can be created near the coastal reservoir. So we have we have to look at some newer ways of generating power at our coastal reservoir, not just by the uh, the generator power through the uh, waterfalls. Okay, so anyway, we already created which will be there for another 50 to 100 years maybe that will go on. But we have to look at the new solutions for creating power using solar on our coastal reservoir, wind energy on a coastal reservoir. Because now, please remember, my coastal reservoir water is still unlike the ocean. We can put these windmills and then solar panels onto my coastal reservoir water, which is a still water. This is still water. So, and also water ducts are very small. See, my coastal reservoir, not like very great uh, large dams, like 300 meters or 100 meters or 50 meters. They are maybe 15 to 20 meters high. And towards the coast, the depths are much smaller, three to four meters only. So we can place the uh, floating floor of, uh, uh, the solar panels, and we can put uh, windmills and all these uh, areas and which we can generate power and generate. And it can be used even to pump water upstream. Thank you very much. Next question is, can Coast Reservoir deal with post-flood water crisis like the one that happened in Kerala after August 2018 flood? Definitely. You see, please understand now, we are creating a channel of flow of water which will directly get into the coastal reservoir. So in flood control, these reservoirs also will help you in flood control and also will not only allow you to save good quality water into in our inland only, not allowing into the ocean, it also provides the flood control measure. So this, uh, this is a very, very, very unique, you know, but we need to study and appropriately locate these uh, reservoirs and where you draw your water from into our reservoir is also a big uh, challenging issue. It is not a simple trivial issue. We need to study and look at the feasibilities and then uh, we have to go for the implementation plan. Thank you. Uh, next question uh, about the, you mentioned about this one already, flood. And then this flood can, could be come from the seawater flood, like the Chennai in 2005 mm -hmm. tsunami. The, the question is, we know that most of the populated population resident near the coast and most of the sediments are facing problems regarding sea surging and uh, floods. Do the coast reservoirs will help to control tsunami? We no, no, I, I'm not saying we can control tsunami, but definitely coastal reservoir will act like a buffer. Will act like a buffer so that, you know, we, our, uh, uh, the surges will not come and hit the, uh, our towns and villages. So, coastal reservoir definitely acts like a buffer and takes away uh, the uh, the still water, still water actually in between the ocean and the habitat, acts like a buffer. So, which is actually a fantastic uh, thing for uh, controlling most of the tsunami effects. But may, may not be completely; you cannot eliminate it. 
and sometimes even you know tsunami might uh, put in some salt water into the reservoir so but that all is uh, we have to learn to handle the things as we go along that means even some salt water might join the water but please remember that this there will be an outlet to this so you can empty slowly and get new water new fresh water in the next monsoon so there is not much of a danger from that angle but definitely it looks like a buffer for the many tsunamis and surges thank you chennai city face face the flood due to uh, unable to cope with the storm water drainage and an entry year situation do you think cost reservoir will work in chennai where the city unable to drain out the excess water <laughs> No, see, it is a very specific question, uh, which uh, I don't think we can answer right away. Why? Because we need to look at the feasibility of yeah. how much water is going out of the city, where we can store, how we can do this. This is not a very simple thing. But we have done this for Mangalore city, for example. For Mangalore city, we wanted to store 50 TMC of water uh, very close to the coast of Mangalore city. and we were able to we demonstrated that it is feasible through river netravati alone okay river netravati alone so but unfortunately you know city is going for desalination when you have 400 tmc of water joining the ocean every year without fail if you look at last 100 year data from netravati river alone near mangalore uh, on the bay, on the arabian sea uh, coast water is simply joining 400 tmc of water in 3 to 4 months of monsoon religiously and quality of water is reasonably good during monsoon very good quality of water you can actually directly drink that water and such water we are allowing it to ocean and then allowing and then then taking that back and try to clean that up using desalination which is really a waste uh, waste of exercise so i am really dead against down the desalination plants putting up at mangalore city when compared to we can put a small coastal there i'll just tell you a small experience there we went to coastal town of mangalore and we saw fishermen have created a small fresh water ponds in their yards so that clearly demonstrates that our people are very smart enough to show that they need to store water when there is no water see the shortage only comes in summer it is not in the monsoon in the summer months you have to learn to store what so that storage will take you to the next level thank you thank you one we still have another 50 minutes in the cry or we can close it also early <laughs> uh, we seven, have seven minutes more seven okay. minutes more okay uh, here this question could be uh, our coast re regions are also fairly populated Have you looked at the non-availability around the coastal zone? Uh, as I told you, we haven't looked at for the entire country. We have looked at some one or two locations, and uh, that is Mangalore. We have looked at there is a clear availability, and uh, for Godavari, we have looked at there is a clear availability. See, Godavari River even today. You see, I have to tell you this: Arthur Cotton, as early as in 1800s. arthur cotton argues with british and builds the baraj and today east godavari and west godavari districts are rice bowls of india you know he basically used the flood water storage in these baraj diverted this water into the fields and used it today he has been treated like a god in the east godavari and west godavari dr arthur cotton is one of the greatest agriculture engineer of india okay in the british india time and he argues to britishers while constructing this baraj he says one day of godavari outflow into bay of bengal is equal into one year outflow of river thames in england i will repeat it one year outflow of river thames in england is equal to one day outflow of godavari and that is today also valid during monsoon time please understand this even today the outflow of godavari is so much and i mean i don't think they can hold the water so every year this is the same scenario krishna we are reasonably used well but not godavari river thank you all right <coughs> professor pasha 
Mahishi Wani as uh, say on behalf of all us actually say thank you, Professor Sisana, for a very interesting presentation. With cost reservoirs to water extent, we can meet Indian's future water need compared to existing surface tanks or reservoirs. Also, any thought on the cost benefit aspect? I would like to hear caution some people. See, please understand whatever we are doing on the surface water, whatever we have constructed dams, we have to maintain them, look after them well. This is a futuristic one. So we need to look at coastal reservoir as a new generation out of the box idea. And we have to augment more water, groundwater using underground dams and conventional rainwater harvesting techniques, which we have forgotten. We have to actually revive all those rainwater harvesting techniques, our ancestor knew. With all doing that also, we will fall shortage of water. Please understand, with all doing that also, we feel shortage of water because our population has exponentially grown and now we are becoming an industrialized nation. For any industry to survive, water is very critical. Every, any industry, even electronic industry requires large amount of water. Even making chips, making large amount of water. Now, if you get large amount of companies from China to India, now my friend will, <laughs> will, uh, will help me. A lot of Indian companies from China, they have come to India. We, we need to provide them. One is the land, one is the water. If you are gone building dams, interior dams, then taking away land, so where are we going to give the land we will give for the for, uh, industries? So we need to save that land, what we have for the industries, but we need to come up with innovative plans for storage of our water. This is what I'm looking at. So this innovative storage of water is very essential to become world leader in, in, uh, in another 30 to 50 years to, uh, down the road. Unless we adopt a huge emission water to store water uh, in right places and right location. Second point, our coastal towns are population increasing. Majority of coastal towns population is increasing. So we need to also give water, food and energy to these coastal towns. These coastal reservoirs will supply that. Third one, due to climate change, our rainfall is actually shifted to coastal areas. Large, if you can see, Kerala got flooded because of large, huge rainfall in the uh, monsoon. Similarly, Mangalore gets large amount of water, 5,000 millimeter rainfall. Or, you see, please understand, if it is average is 1,000 millimeter, coastal areas of India gets almost close to 3,000 to 5,000 millimeter average rainfall. That means, it's, is it not wise to store water where water is available to you? Or you want to build up uphill in the Western Ghats Dam and then find water, there is no water there because rainfall is reduced. So our rainfall, because of climate change, is shifted to coast. We need to look at coastal reservoir as a solution. So these three points, one is the availability of land, and then uh, the climate change aspects, and what, where water is available, we need to construct. Probably there will be the last question, right? Uh, when the Yinchi team from Vivid Shama, sir, is government of India working on the concept of second generation cost reservoir? If not, why? See, as I told you already, I've shown you, government of India has already planned in Gulf of Kambat. If you go to their site, Kalpasar website, they've already called for tender for geotechnical investigation. Okay, so Gulf of Kambat is going to be the one of the largest coastal reservoir. And I've already shown you the modified plan, wherein part of that will be salt water. We are not going to build a very huge reservoir. We are going to be half of that will be the freshwater reservoir. Only the dam height will be now longer so that we can retain the lives of the, uh, the fishermen and uh, salt manufacturers and all that will remain. Only one portion will be used for freshwater reservoir. It's a very unique project. India is actually thought very well in this, but somehow it's a very slow. After the Honorable Prime Minister moved to the central government, I think the work on that is a little slow down. When he was the Chief Minister of Gujarat, I think that project has started. And even I saw the news, it was handed over to Koreans to build that dam, the Kalpasar project. So that is what afterwards I don't know much uh, because I'm watching the website, but uh, recently they've called for a geotechnical investigation uh, for this project. 
So there is a thought process. It is not that India has not thought about coastal desert ban. As I told you, if you can look at some of our papers, we have looked at Tanir Mukam ban and several of the water reservoirs in Kerala are because of the coastal reservoirs. They have done it in a very way, but maintenance is a major issue there. So we need to do much, much better work, quality work in maintaining those coastal reservoirs, what we have constructed in Kerala and what we are going to construct in uh, Gujarat. And I think there is a good possibility, uh, even on the other coast of Bay of Bengal, there are quite a, because large of our rivers are draining to Bay of Bengal. So that is where we have to look at it. But there is an issue of pollution, how to handle that. And we need to learn using co second generation coastal reservoir. We can definitely do this. Thank you very much, Professor Sana. Uh, I can see the to tonight's information, your message is very clear. India is not running out of water, water is running out of India. Tonight, we also have the international participants. Probably this message is true for other countries also, for Indonesia. Yeah. For China, for worldwide the same. Yeah, please. If you allow me, you know, when I made this presentation in Australia in your workshop, so immediately you came up with a Sarovar Mala concept for Australia, and my friend Lin Sinpa came with for Malaysia, and Taiwan, China. So that means the concept of connecting rivers along the coast at zero means level without much of a thing. Connecting them, connecting coastal reservoir, immediately caught an eye from among all the researchers across the world. I think uh, you know you should share that information as well as a secretary of the society, please. Yeah, yeah, sure. And also the message is very clear. In the world, uh, for SDG six is the core of SDGs seventeen. This is the core because water is different from other things is the knife. And uh, we don't have water shortage. Our shortage is storage shortage. That's a very important message for everybody. And uh, now we're very clear. We know in future, most of people will live in the coast area. And then our next generation, our grandchildren, grandchildren's grandchildren will drink water from coast reservoir. The starting point from tonight, welcome everybody from the world to attend tonight's seminar, tonight's webinar. <coughs> Thank you very much. And I to hand over to, to the organizer. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sitarab. That was wonderful. You took us on a journey of water storage solutions uh, from a century ago and brought us to where we are today. Uh, clearly, the solutions lie in thinking differently and thinking out of the box. And today you talked with us through what those solutions could be. So thank you very much. I think uh, just judging by the number of questions, the interest is extremely high and there are a lot of uh, thought that is going into this, uh, these ideas. We'll probably need to do yet another session to address all of the questions that have been <laughs> coming. So at some point of time, I, we will look forward to having both you and Professor Xu Ching with us uh, on, on, a, on a different discussion around all of this. But thank you, Professor Xu Ching. Uh, it's thank you. It's eight in the night for you, and we really appreciate your taking time to be with My us pleasure. here today. As I said, I am in the India also. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> when, when I first spoke with Professor Xu Ching, he said, I feel an Indian, I'm not a foreigner. So thank yes. you for, for being with us here. And um, uh, both Professor Sitaram and Professor Xu Ching said, don't worry. So for those who are Bangaloreans, they are working on a solution for us. And in the near future, we are going to see something actually come by. So thank you all. And thank you uh, the, uh, for, to all the attendees for having uh, joined us uh, this evening. Uh, the, as we said, the recording will be uploaded onto our IIT ACB YouTube channel. Please do look for it. And also, please look for many, many more interesting webinars we're going to be doing this every Saturday. So thank you very much and uh, have a great evening. Thank you. Thank Namaste you. To...